بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ٹوڈے وی ول گو بیک ٹو واٹ از ٹریڈیشنلی کالڈ اکنامک تھیوری سو اٹس ناٹ ایٹ دس ٹائم اٹ از ناٹ انف ٹو سی کہ تھیوری آف فارم از جسٹ بنک وچ اٹ از یو ہیو ٹو پروو وائی اینڈ ایکسپلین ہاؤ and uh, so we are going to explain why the theory of firm that is taught in textbooks all over the world is just wrong and this is not my discovery many other people have said it it's just that the um, power of the hegemonic discourse is so strong that people cannot uh, accept the idea that what everybody is saying can be wrong So first we understand that the theory of firm is not based on any study of real world firm. You just take a piece of paper and you start writing equations. You never go and you never cross tally that, okay, this is what our theory says. And now we look at firm, Adamji, and we see that this is what corresponds to anything in our theory. So there's never any check. You start from imagination and you end in imagination. You never compare with reality. So, there is the thing that actually the assumptions that are made are self-contradictory and why there is a reason that basically the whole theory of the firm, the idea is to get to the conclusion, there are two conclusions that we want to get. One is that the labor is paid the marginal product and capital is paid marginal product so that everybody is getting what they deserve. <coughs> so, Basically, the theory is designed to uh, prove that uh, people get uh, what they deserve. So, the idea that the Marxist idea that laborers are being exploited, this should be uh, blocked by the theory. So, the other condition is that firms should have zero profits in the long run. Now, that's because if the firm have profits, then they should share them with the laborer. They don't want to do that. They want to give them... the wage. So this, uh, this is the preconception that drives the theory. You have to get to this result somehow or the other, even if you make uh, contradictory assumptions, this is what you must get at the end. <clears throat> so there are errors and contradictions in assumptions, many people have pointed them out and we will show some of them today. Uh, so if you look at the theory, try to match it with real, firm, real world firm behavior. There is no match. And that is why it's so difficult to understand this SRMPC, LRMPC, APC, this, that and the other. Because it has no correspondence. It's just purely an imaginary concept. You have, you, the only thing you can do is memorize it. You can't understand it because it's not understandable. Now I will give, tell you, I'll give you a theory which is easy to understand and shows why all this is wrong. And you can explain. Now one very important thing that... Uh, my students especially must learn is that I can make big claims that all firm theory is bunk. You cannot. So when you do that, you, should, uh, you have to start with evidence. You have to use empirical evidence. You have to use mathematics. And you can, um, you have to do it in a simple way. And this requires work. So you have, that's why I say go and talk with your roommates. If you can convince them, then you can. Uh, learn how to do that on a, in an interview, which you will need to do. If you say, oh, all of the theory is bunk, then you will just fail the interview. <laughs> so, uh, one of my students who was, got a PhD, he was, just got a job recently in uh, Perry, in Punjab, and he was telling me that, the Vase, so they, they are saying, my students now, that now if we say that Asad Zaman says it, then they accept it. So that's <laughs> another weapon. So, uh, and, ah, exactly. So he told me that the interview was all about, it lasted two minutes and it's all about, are you a Sadhaman student? Yes. How many courses have you taken? Yes. So nothing, <laughs> nothing else was asked. So it's a big responsibility when uh, somebody says I'm a Sadhaman student, then actually people become afraid a little bit. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's something in your favor, but don't, don't overplay your hand. And uh, so... Um, 
you have to learn how to uh, do an argument. You can't argue by authority. You can't say that this is true because Asad Zaman says so. You have to um, learn what the argument is and not only that, it's not that, that, that okay, you come and take the course and then you will understand. No, you have to break down the argument into a very simple thing which anybody can understand. Otherwise, you say you come and take the course, then you will understand. It's not uh, going to work. So, <coughs> I am trying to give you uh, ways to do these things. So I'm going to construct a simple model, but I'm going to explain many things which they don't explain in variant, for example. So, uh, one thing that you need to do when you construct a simple model is that you want to take most of the factors outside. You want to work with only a small number of factors which you want to study and the factors which are <coughs> outside the model you don't want to study. But uh, you can't declare something to be exogenous. I'm not going to study it so it's exogenous. No, exogenous has a meaning. It has to be done and I'll explain how it is done because you can't understand by just this abstract method. So exogenous factors are outside which we are not going to model, we take them as determined, fixed and uh, while we are manipulating things inside the model, those things should not change. Endogenous factors are the things that we are studying, I ch what happens if I change this, what happens if I change that. So inside the model we have endogenous variable, outside we have exogenous. But the, the key thing is that when you are changing your endogenous variables, this should not have any effect on the exogenous variables, that's very important. So, now we are going to take uh, prices and wages that are exogenous in this. We are going to set up a model of firms, but these are agricultural firms. So, uh, so we don't make variables exogenous by refusing to study them. And uh, so, how do we make prices and wages exogenous? It, has the, it relates to certain structural features which our model will have, which I will show you. So, we consider that we have a small village. There is rural agricultural production and there is a large ma labor market in the nearby city. So the wages are controlled and set by big forces which the little village which hires people, it, uh, it uh, hires them at going wage rates which are. So landlords, you are going to have landlords and farmer are the same. Uh, the farmer is not actually going to do any work, all he does is own the land and he organizes the work. So he doesn't have any control on the wages, he cannot uh, because the market wages are determined. So there is a both custom and market social norms dictate standard wage for labor. So if he says to somebody that I will hire you but at half price, uh, this actually can work in a non-market economy in many ways but basically it's not just, th there is the market mechanism which enforces um, that he can get another job at the same way. But even if it not, uh, there is the social norm that he says, look, everybody else is paying 100 rupees. It's not fair for you to pay me 50 rupees. And this is something which everybody understands. So it's not the market mechanism, but actually if there is a going wage rate, the hardy kisi ki to phir, uh, that's what you pay. Uh, or you can pay more, but you can't pay less. Otherwise, it's considered unjust. And similarly, so what we produce, we sell everything in the big market. We don't have, we don't buy it, we don't use it in our own little village. This is also important. That makes the price exogenous. Because, and it also ensures something very important that all this production is being done for the profit motive. Now, it makes perfect sense for the landlord. We can't say that, look, you're doing a social service, produce your wheat and give it to the people. No, that's the, all of this work activity is designed to earn money, so he's going to maximize profits. There is no perfectly valid assumption. Now, if you have a village which is organized as a self-sufficient economy and you're producing food for your own village, it's an entirely different situation. And then other motives will come in. Um, so, um, these are the assumptions. So, uh, ah, yes, another assumption that I will make in this analysis is that all the prices are known. So price, this is a traditional economy running for a long time in stable equilibrium. Prices are determined and they will remain. This is actually a, a bad assumption in the real world, but we just simplify it to keep it away. Then we can later introduce what happens if there is uncertainty. 
and we will discuss that. What if we don't know exactly what the price is going to be tomorrow when the harvest time comes? But basically, as long as the amount of uh, produce that we are producing doesn't actually impact on the market, then everything is fine. Now, this is one set of assumptions, but notice that when we make something exogenous, we have to we have to do it very carefully there, and we will show how what happens if if things are not exogenous. So, for example, if the wages, uh, villages are sufficient, then um, the amount of the harvest, uh, the amount that you plant will determine the labor supply. It will also determine the output. And so the output, if it is large, it will have an effect on the price. It will have an effect on the labor market. Everything is together. This is the general equilibrium story, which we will get to slowly. Uh, that's what I, my hope is anyway. But we'll build it up one piece at a time so that you can understand every piece as opposed to just doing mathematics without understanding. So if you have a, a, a closed economy, the village is self-sufficient, it's producing food, it's produ then everything is linked to each other. You can't analyze things in isolation. There's no, uh, all of these things, the prices will not be exogenous. That's, that's the key thing. So you can't put them out of the model. You can't say that, okay, in a village I'm going to study, but I'm going to pretend that the prices are exogenous. This is just wrong reasoning. But this is what is done because they never explain what exogeneity means in uh, variant and uh, similar textbooks. So if there was self-sufficiency, then the motivations would change, the prices would change, uh, the wages would change, everything would change. So those, those are uh, not. So, so we have made a model carefully to prevent this from happening so that we can study some things in isolation. So let's suppose now that there are two activities that you can do on your farm. You can either keep 10 sheep per acre or you can grow 10 bales of cotton. Each sheep produces one kilogram of wool. Uh, this is annual production. And one shepherd can look after 10 sheep. Alternatively, if you go for cotton farming, then you have to take 10 laborers to produce the cotton. Cotton is labor intensive. So we maximize, so given the any particular price configuration, we can maximize uh, profits easily. And maximization of profits is perfectly reasonable assumption in this setup. So I suppose that um, so in general what I'm going to tell you is that supply and demand knowledge are wrong uh, typically very very rare cases that they work and they're wrong because prices are endogenous typically uh, so um, but but uh, so so this makes a big difference but uh, just because you see so in, under normal circumstances, you just forget this theory is totally useless. What we are doing is trying to uh, trying to take neoclassical theory at their own home ground. So that would not be necessary. Hopefully, 10, 15, 20 years from now, when neoclassical theory is forgotten and buried, then this will not be necessary. But now we are trying to say, okay, suppose uh, we take all your assumptions as given, and then then we show that your model doesn't lead to the right results. So this is what we are doing, because this is what you need to argue these days, because everybody is brainwashed into believing that these theories are correct. So suppose now wool is 25 rupees per kg, and cotton is 50 rupees per bale, and suppose that the wage is 50 rupees per laborer. Then if you grow wool, you will grow 10 units, to 250 will be your uh, revenue, and you will pay one laborer 50 units, so you will get 200. As opposed to this, cotton will earn 500 50 times 10, but you will also pay 50 times 10 to your labor, so you will have zero profit. So definitely, you will uh, start, uh, you will uh, produce wool instead of cotton. Now, the thing is that this depends on the price. If the wages change, if you, uh, if the, um, wage goes down to 10 rupees, then your wool will earn 240, 250 minus 10, but the cotton will now earn 500 minus 100, 400, so it will become more profitable. So this makes a lot of sense, that is uh, one activity is labor intensive, so if labor is cheap, you will prefer that, the other activity, if labor is expensive, you will prefer the other activity. 
there is a critical point uh, I can calculate you can calculate it too it's 250 over 9 you can do the little algebra and see that at this uh, price at this wage both will earn equal profits now uh, there is a style of modeling that I will not be able to teach you but you will want to learn on your own and this is the way that you should be doing your thesis eventually you're all PhD students so basically the traditional neoclassical model says that everyone maximizes now this doesn't work very well it's not true nobody uh, basically the problem is that there is too much uncertainty you don't know many things you don't know the future price uh, you don't know how much output will be produced and so uh, maximization is just not possible but you follow strategies uh, that you based on what you can see and then uh, you see that the tool that is now coming into uh, use more and more is called uh, evolutionary learning so basically you try so in your model and, and this is something which only the computer will be able to do you won't be able to do but that's good that's what you want basically in all such cases you know the complicated cal calculations sh the computer should be doing but you should have an understanding of what it is that the concepts so that you can create the right problem like this model that I have created it's it's very difficult to do that I mean it's because of my experience that I can create such a model and you have to learn how to create such models I mean how do you isolate the relevant parts which, which where you will get interesting results so this is the hard job this is a conceptual job it doesn't have to do with the, the kind of economics that you have been taught uh, solving differential equations has nothing to do with economics but setting up the model correctly this is important and this is a difficult skill and needs to be learned but it's it's a skill of a different type and so currently you're just doing learning by doing so now uh, uh, the maximization theory says that okay you, you set up your objective function and you maximize so now here if the wage is uh, 27.78 then you will grow wool and if it's 27.76 then you will grow cotton now this doesn't make any sense this is not how the world is so in evolutionary learning this is uh, the people just try some strategy at random and they look around what's, uh, what's happening to the other people and they see that if somebody is doing better then they try to imitate that strategy so slowly they would converge to the maximum if the maximum is clearly distinguished but if the maximum is not clearly distinguished like at this boundary then there will be people fluctuating somebody will randomly go into wool somebody will randomly go into cotton and the both will and, and near uh, the maximization point both uh, types of people will exist so the prediction of the maximization theory is very wrong that uh, at $27 you, uh, everybody will be doing uh, cotton farming and at 28 everybody will be doing wool farming but in reality this is not what's going to happen and if you have a evolutionary learning model where people shift strategies slowly as they learn then this will not happen and this is a type of model that is just coming into uh, fashion and so this would be an ideal thing for you to do a PhD thesis using. So now this model that I have made I have uh, tried to get something that I read that is that in the privatization the early privatization labor was scarce wages were high and so conversions were to pastures for sheep. So in later privatization as you know that when the privatization occurred then people became hopeless, homeless and then they became hopeless also and then they became laborers and so a large uh, labor uh, supply came into existence which would be willing to work for small wages so in later private it, it, the process took more than a hundred years then people were converting it into labor intensive farming but early privatization was for sheep so this now this model explains uh, this uh, aspect of reality it's a very simple model but it explains why uh, that would have happened. Now one thing we are doing this is called an activity analysis model that we have fixed proportions so one laborer, ten sheep, one acre. Uh, so the 
traditional models, uh, the Cobb Douglas, etc., they have uh, they don't have activity analysis. They have uh, free substitution, so you can, if you have more land, you can substitute uh, more land can substitute for less labor. First of all, it's not very realistic. Uh, this doesn't happen, and you can't substitute land for labor. You can't uh, if you have seeds and if you have uh, sheep, then you remove one sheep and add one laborer to produce more wool. This is just nonsense. Uh, furthermore, uh, at a given set of prices, there exists only one optimal activity, one proportion that which you will use. So even if there is substitutability, and in some processes there is substitutability, even then activity analysis doesn't cause you any harm as long as your prices are fixed. So if you are doing an analysis in which the prices are fixed, then you can without any hesitation, without any harm, without any damage, you can assume an activity analysis fixed proportion model, which is very easy to understand. And we want to work with easy to understand model, because the goal of model is not to confuse students, it is to make a very complicated reality understandable. So when this is the goal of the model, then the models in the textbooks are just nonsense because they, I mean, students can understand the real world much better than they can understand the models. So um, now one of the interesting things, so as if the price configurations are changing, then the patterns of projection will change. This is what we have already shown. And if you have like a continuous Cobb Douglas type model, then as the prices change continuous, can, uh, continuously, your activity will also change continuously. So a typical activity analysis model like the one that I have made, I have only two activities. But you can put in 8 or 10 or 12 and basically that's all you need. That is, and you don't need this continuous change. And in order to understand the real world, you just need a small finite set of activities. And they will model any real world situation that you can imagine. And they should provide an adequate approximation to understand. So you don't need to really go outside of activity analysis models, which are very easy to understand. Everybody can understand activity analysis. Nobody understands Cobb Douglas because it doesn't make sense actually. Cobb Douglas model doesn't make sense. I mean, you can't substitute sheep for labor. <laughs> so um, now it is true that if the price configurations change, then uh, activity will change. And so you can you can take that into account by activity analysis, by having multiple activities as we have done. And now one very interesting thing that just a side note not related to this is that uh, what we are doing here quite often because we just blindly follow the West, whatever they do, we do. So they have very expensive labor, so they do they do activities which are uh, capital intensive. Now, if we want to do the same thing here, we should use a labor-intensive version of the activity. And uh, many people have pointed this out, but just people want to say, we want to build the latest technology, what is the best in the USA, we want to have that here. So if that's not uh, appropriate, then um, it can cause us uh, economic damage, and it happens all the time. because people don't understand uh, economics because they have these wrong models which they are using. So now, long time ago in 1920-30, uh, Piero Srafa uh, objected to the firm theory uh, uh, that is taught in the textbooks today. He made uh, that this theory of competitive equilibrium of firm and industry can only work in very special conditions. He says that competitive structure can only exist under constant returns to scale and not under increasing or decreasing returns to scale. So I want to explain why this objection is valid. And uh, so what that causes problems in the sense that the traditional theory says that the marginal cost must be increasing. If the marginal cost is constant, then the firm can expand, especially if the price is above marginal cost, as it will always be, as we will show. So uh, the additional you just produce will uh, give you more profit. So there's no, you should never stop at a point where MC is either decreasing or if it is constant. Uh, so this is uh, against what all the textbooks in the world in micro uh, uh, teach. Uh, but it's very easy to prove 
what Sharafa said is true. So, what is this DRTS and CRTS? First, uh, returns to scale is a proportionate increase in all factors of production. So, if I have 100 sheep and 10 laborers and 10 acres, then I go to 20 sheep and 20, uh, 200 laborers and uh, 20 laborers and 200 sheep and 200, uh, so whatever. <laughs> double land and double laborers. So, if you double all the inputs, do you get exactly double output? That's CRTS, constant returns to scale. If you get less than that, you get diminishing returns to scale. If you get more than that, you have increasing returns to scale. Now, it's very important to keep yourself clear about uh, increasing one factor while keeping the other fixed. That's an entirely different matter. That doesn't, doesn't have to do with returns to scale. So, marginal product of labor is calculated holding the other factor land fixed and in this case we have diminishing returns. Suppose you have one laborer with 10 sheep, the value of an additional laborer is zero because there's nothing for him to do. However, you can also switch technologies and so you can switch from, if you have two laborers you can switch to uh, cotton production or maybe you can um, assi assign him to do one bale of cotton and uh, reduce one sheep or something. So it's possible that you can get marginal product out, but uh, this is something which will take time tra transiting from one type of uh, product, uh, from one type of activity to other. So uh, the marginal product of labor is time dependent concept. It is not necessarily and this is this is because the model that you, are, you have in which things are malleable, you can just add one labor and get additional output. Uh, this may be possible, but it may be possible after time, after changing the technology, after saying, okay, we will plot part, partition one part of the land into a, co a cotton plot and let the rest be used by. Um, so marginal productive labor is not easy to calculate for the long run. In the short run, if you just say, okay, okay we are taking technology sheep as given, then the marginal product is zero. And so you have diminishing returns in labor. But that doesn't have anything to say about what's uh, the returns to scale when you, you uh, when you do all outputs. So actually, students often get confused about this. So I'm making this clearer. So now what Srafa says is that increasing returns to scale is not compatible with a competitive market. So what happens if you if farm size double, it becomes more efficient, then what will happen in the village? What? There will be only one farm, yes. I mean, you know, the bigger farm will be making more profits, it will gobble up all the small ones and become more and more efficient. So ultimately, there, all of the land will go into one farm. So the competitive market structure cannot emerge with increasing returns to scale. And diminishing returns to scale, you have the opposite problem. If you have a large farm, you, you break it up into two and you get more efficiency. So you could keep subdividing until you get to uh, infinitely small farm. So that also doesn't make sense. Now, the thing is that you don't have to have the same type of returns to scale at every size. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a typical picture of what might happen, that you might have increasing returns to scale for small farms up to one acre, and then from one acre to two acre you have constant returns to scale, and then from two acre onward you have diminishing returns to scale. So this, ca this can be true. So then basically in long run equilibrium farm size must be in the CRTS range. And if this farm is, is smooth, then there's only one farm size that's reasonable. So in that case, you have farm size is fixed by the returns to scale. It can only be constant returns to scale. It, it can only have constant returns to scale at that size. Now, already this model that we have produced is um, in contradiction with the neoclassical theory in many ways. First of all, uh, the marginal product of labor, the marginal value product of labor must be above the wage. Yeah, you must be earning profit, otherwise uh, you would not hire labor. Now the idea 
that you keep on hiring until uh, you get uh, zero, this doesn't work in this model as you can see because you have a uh, activity analysis type model. Once you have hired your, the additional labor doesn't bring you any output, it's zero value. So there is a capacity, there's a maximum number of labors that you can hire. And so uh, at the, uh, when you hire the maximum, there is some marginal value product and it's higher than the wage. And the, then you cannot, you see in the continuous model, you, you hire, keep hiring hours of laborer until you get, but you don't hire hours, you hire additional laborers. So again, this is an illusion created by a wrong type of model. Uh, so marginal is higher. The village has a capacity, limited capacity. If, even if all the land is in one farm, then uh, that's it. I mean, there's a maximum capacity of labor you can hire. And the village is small, so uh, the uh, wages themselves will not adjust to the excess demand. This is again a confusion that arises between uh, when you look at the firm, small, or the industry large and they think that both of them are the same. The industry is just n times the firm, but actually we are going to show that this is not the case. Therefore, basically you can have positive profits and they can persist. There is no mechanism which will uh, may drive the profits to zero because entry cannot occur into this village anyway because uh, the amount of, uh, so basically the free entry hypothesis is what drives the profits to zero and as, as I've said uh, this is a requirement of neoclassical theory to make sure that the w w w w wages are being the laborers are receiving just wages so the firm is not making excess profits but here the firm can and will so that uh, in our model the wage is greater than the marginal value product of labor uh, remember that there is marginal physical product and marginal value product so Exploitation of labor is possible because you can make huge profits the wage if the wage is low in your uh, now one more thing is that the return to land is a parasitical thing that the person who owns the land he's not doing anything he's not providing any social service so all of the revenue that he is getting is just uh, uh, unjust actually that's the only thing you can can't talk about efficiency here, you can talk about lack of justice. So what we should do is that he should split it half and half. And this is the kind of thing that happens in Batai, that if you say that, okay, you work for me and whatever you produce, we can share half and half. So at least some part of the injustice is remedied. Uh, now there is one more thing that if there, there can be entrepreneurship, there's somebody who's managing the farm. And so if the farmer is not an absentee landlord, he's on the job and he's looking after the sheep and he's taking care of their medicine and he's hiring the labor, then he's, then he's, this is not a parasitical activity, this is a entrepreneurship. So actually what happens is that in neoclassical theory, you, you mix the two so that, I mean, so that uh, you are not, uh, so basically to hide the parasitical nature of this activity. In many other places, the same thing is done. The interest is also a parasitical uh, earning. And uh, unfortunately, even Muslim economists have been deceived by neoclassical theory, so they don't understand this. So instead of saying we should ban interest because it's parasitical, they say we should make sure that the interest uh, is, uh, we should try to find loopholes in the Sharia so that we can uh, pay interest. So there is a return to entrepreneurship, there is a return to land and currently in my model I don't, I don't differentiate between the two but we can understand this in the model that there is something that is happening, some return. Uh, the firms are earning more than uh, what the, uh, their cost, so they are making profits, making pure profits. Laborers are getting uh, the value of what they produce. Uh, no, no, the marginal value of what they produce is higher than the wage. Now, as I said, 
the theory itself is wrong and this is only theory also it doesn't match the reality so uh, most recently i think in the 1990s alan blinder who was a famous economist he studied the firms and he asked them uh, about uh, he took a survey of the firms to see about their cost structures and whether they satisfy the neoclassical assumptions so he found that almost all the firms are price makers rather than price takers they set the price so automatically you are out of the competitive market one very important thing to understand is that in connection with supply and demand is that the supply curve is determined by saying that here is the market price what will you produce if the firm sets price then there is no supply so supply and demand curve is finished and almost all the firms in his study are price makers uh other people who have because that's actually he didn't study agriculture exclude ag- agriculture is the one area where uh you have large uniform products like rice and wheat and that sort of satisfies and lots of farms so that sort of satisfies competitive conditions and in those conditions uh the uh, farmer doesn't say that okay my rice will sell for so much um so now the other people who have uh, studied this as i said agriculture is about 2% of the economy in the usa so uh and other people have said okay there are some other uh, sectors in the economy as well where price taking is common so maybe it's about 11% that's the maximum you can go so about 90% of the economy the firms are price makers so competitive theory of the firm doesn't apply now this is something that you can cite and in an argument that everybody can understand that 90% of the firms and the and also this will give you some appearance of having some knowledge about the real world <laughs> that 90% of the firm where does nobody else see this is the this is the weak point of the neoclassical economists they not they know nothing about the real world so this is the ground on which you must attack them you must you cannot attack them on ideological grounds that you are wrong because uh, firms are exploiting laborers this will not carry any weight uh, but if you say that 90 of the percent of the firms in the us according to uh, alan blinder study <laughs> show that that this shows that you are literate you have you have read and you have empirical evidence and 90% are price makers which means that they cannot be competitive firms now there is no answer to this argument <clears throat> so um, again yani knowledge of the real this that's where you impress people by knowing some things about so for example there was a period uh basically after the dollar was floated <clears throat> and it was i mean it was uh, after the vietnam war where the us incurred a lot of budget deficit and so they had to print a lot of dollars so they couldn't back it up so these are things which nobody knows i mean nobody in conventional even though it's very simple baby facts about economics which everybody should know but you can have a course in monetary theory and not learn about this a simple fact that dollar was floated because america spent a lot of money on the vietnam war and they could not back up their dollars with gold so they delinked after that there was a period in which currencies were fluctuating very wildly because <clears throat> nobody knew uh, what uh, what would happen so in that period mercedes benz which is max- manufactured in germany And therefore all its production function and costs are in deutschmarks it had a fixed price for mercedes benz in germany and another fixed price in dollars and the dollar price never changed throughout this four or five year period where the uh, deutschmark us fluctuated uh, wildly so now if you say that this has something to do with marginal cost or any uh, thing with the cost structure then you can't uh, defend this hypothesis because costs were in deutschmarks and dollar market was fluctuating so the dollar price should have fluctuated but it didn't and so you have to say that there is some other uh, something other than the supply side factors determines and supply and demand determines the price uh 
similarly, uh, firms want to be price makers. Uh, so they use branding to take the same thing and convert it into a, a specialized thing which is and then again you can set the price. So in fact in the USA uh, you have some generic factories which are marketing freezers, washing machines, refrigerators, other appliances, these are generic. Then they go to the store and, and Sears Roebuck they put their own brand on it and then they sell it at some price. In others, so Walmart, they put their own brand and they put sell it at another price. So it's exactly the same thing, but selling for different prices under different brands. So again, all of this shows that the conventional theory of the firm is wrong. It doesn't uh, describe the reality that we live in. Actually, and you can say that in a long, long time ago, uh, when the theory was formulated, it was formulated for farms with agricultural products which were homogenous and uniform and there were many producers. So in these cases it works, but that's no longer a big part of the economy in the West and uh, yani a large portion of the economy in the East also is uh, outside. Even in Pakistan, the agriculture sector is about one third or something like that. 20%? 20%. So, um, another uh, finding of the Allen Blinders survey was that prices are sticky, the prices are set by the firms and they review them every once in a while. The median uh, uh, number of price changes is 1.4, that is most uh, of the firms do an annual review. They set the price at the beginning of the year, then demand, supply, it may keep on fluctuating, prices don't change. Uh, at the end of the year they do a review and maybe they change it. A few firms, about 7%, review prices are weekly, so there are some hot items which they change. So competitive firms are price takers, so this obviously shows that here 93% of the firms in Blinder study are, are not even changing their prices, they fix them for the year. So. Uh, the competitive firms don't need to review price schedules uh, because price is dictated by the market and uh, so this doesn't this is not the market structure that we see in reality so here is a empirical data that you can use and this is something nobody can deny and it's relatively easy this is also important you can't give an argument that it will take one hour to understand you have to give easy arguments which everybody can understand so now, since these are easy arguments that everybody can understand, they were made. And so the counter arguments were also made. So this is basically, it's all a game of rhetoric. I mean, uh, economic theory is an ideology and they use strategies to get people to believe this ideology and they are very effective. I mean, most of the people fall into the trap of believing these. So you have to understand what tools they use and how you can counter them. So basically, uh, this blinder study is new, long time ago when Friedman, uh, these same type of studies were done and they showed that the firms don't have any idea what their marginal cost is, so they can't set. And uh, when you ask managers how you price, so they they said that we take the cost we can and we do the markup. So the cost markup price is very different from marginal price and you can show that. So, uh, economists were very disturbed because they have to defend their theory. It's not that they, it's not that they are not interested in modeling the real world because that would reveal the reality. They don't want to show. So they want to defend. So they defended. Friedman said that, well, you know, what managers say is different from what they do. So he gave the very famous example that you see, if you have a pool table and the billiard player is playing and he puts the ball in the pocket then uh, he doesn't know any physics but if we assume that he knows physics and he calculated the trajectory we are not making a mistake actually he has learned the physics by experience. So in response to this, uh, this is a wrong argument in many ways but it has been widely accepted and even now you will find this example in many textbooks when they because these studies are now known and uh, some of the more honest 
textbooks like you remember the Borjas in Lebar, he cites the counter example and then he says that this is wrong for some reason or the other. So people uh, uh, who are more honest, they cite the examples which show that firms don't know marginal cost. And so they say, well, uh, then they cite this billiard example made famous by uh, that even if they don't know, uh, they must minimize costs and they must maximize. If they didn't, they would be thrown out of business. This is the survival argument. So now actually survival argument is exactly evolutionary biology argument. So you put it in and you model, then you get very different results from, I mean it's not the survival of the fittest. In fact, even in evolutionary biology, uh, they have recently come, you see, previously they used to believe this, now it's only in the past 20-30 years that they have understood that evolutionary doesn't lead to the survival of the fittest. It's a very interesting, important study which if you, you should learn and understand. Um, this is a study about what they did was they took um, large uh, collections of chicken, poultry and uh, they produced eggs. So they, they had two models. They, they took, in, in one case, they took the most efficient bird the one that was laying the most eggs and they said okay we, we, we have a lot of different farms they all have their own collection of poultry so we take the best uh, layers out from each uh, nest and we put them together to create a new flock uh, the other was that they said okay let's uh, this is called selection at the level of the individual you pick the best individual from wherever he comes from the other uh, methodology was to pick the best farm. Some farms are producing less, some farms are producing more. So you take the whole farm and you say, okay, let's replicate this. Uh, we'll take the descendants of this farm and we, uh, so we, we reproduce them more. So which do you think worked better? The biologist intuition was the same as my intuition and probably the same as your intuition. What is the standard argument that one would think would happen. What What is the, the natural answer to this? The best chicken form is the evolution. The? The, the new form with the best chicken for the more better. With the best chickens, exactly. Uh, yani producing eggs is not a property of the collective, it's a property of the birds. So the best birds, if you put them together, uh, they should produce more. This is what the biologists thought, this is what I thought when I was reading this and this is what everybody thought. But it turns out not to be true. Why? They went back and studied. So they found that there is a dominant bird and it, um, it prevents the others from... Uh, so these are very hostile, competitive and aggressive birds. So they become the top bird not because they are the best at, at producing S but because they are best at suppressing the competition. <laughs> So when you put them all together, you get disastrous results <laughs> because they are all fighting each other. On the other hand, so the farm which uh, the the collection which works best is the one which cooperates the best. So if you take the group which is working most harmoniously, that group produces the best results. So when you put firms together and you try to find out what will happen. You, it's not the, the, the most ruthless and in actually this is what happens in reality when you let firms go then the, the most nastiest uh, firm like Microsoft it wins over firms which have better products and uh, more efficient uh, management and everything. So this is what happens when you allow these ruthless. So that's why we need to have market regulation exactly opposite of what the free market theory says. That you have to regulate, you have to make sure that nobody is playing dirty tricks like uh, Microsoft does all the time. Um, they, what they did even recently, the new Windows was coming out, so they said that we will sell it only if you don't sell any other system. Now the store is in a bind because this is the most popular system, so if there is a more efficient system around, they can't even stock it because uh, so, so now. That is some philosophy. Now we come back to the theory of the firm. 
the effect of constant returns to sales. Now we are going back to what Sarafa said. Saraf, uh, according to Sarafa, if you have uh, constant returns to scale, then the firm size is not determinate. It can be anywhere and uh, on the range of CRTS. So uh, this is different from the uh, standard theory which fixes the firm size at, at the bottom of the uh, cost curve. There is one maximum optimal efficient size. This is not true. This makes a big difference because uh, if the firm size can vary, there is uh, uh, lots of things which matter. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. But suppose that we have a, a, a nice situation where the increasing return to scale hit, hits the CRTS at only one point. So that will fix the firm size. That's the only point at which you can have the firm. Um, that doesn't matter because industry side is still indeterminate because okay you have one firm then you have second firm then you have third firm and you will keep getting producing firms of the perfect size uh, but the industry will be uh, it can keep growing infinitely except for the fact that it is bounded by the land in the village all of the village and the land in the village will be used up for this purpose now we go a little bit beyond this and say okay now we look at, think about the nation as a whole so now we, this is going to interfere with the exogeneity assumptions. So we think of, uh, okay, so there's a nation, there's lots of cities with lots of villages. So everybody is now expanding. So what will happen? So what will happen is that the amount of cotton, the total output of cotton will increase as the industry expands. So firm behavior and industry behavior are very different. Uh, total output will increase. And if you have a national market, then the price of cotton will fall. When the price of cotton falls, then we don't know what will happen. Maybe the activity will shift. Maybe uh, the returns to scale phenomena will change because these are also things that depend on the price. Uh, so basically what we have is complexity. Firm level behavior does not determine what will happen at the industry level and every single textbook will tell you that industry is just the sum of the industry supply curve is the sum of the firm supply curves. This is not true. The firm supply is fixed. The industry supply is actually, uh, the firm supply will not vary, but the firm supply does vary. Industry supply does vary. So many properties of the industry are different. For the industry as a whole, prices is not exogenous. For the firm, price is exogenous. So uh, labor is exogenous. Similarly, for the industry as a whole, uh, labor is not exogenous because as the industry ex expands, it will use huge amounts of labor and so the wage will vary if the demand increases. So um, uh, okay. the empirical evidence says that uh, prices are sticky. So when you have overproduction, uh, it doesn't hit the prices first. Uh, the first thing that gets affected is the inventories. The businesses start holding larger inventories. This is, this is empirical data which in any real world model you have to incorporate. And actually one of the things that Keynes did was to incorporate. This is why his model had sticky prices initially. So industrial expansion will affect the labor market. This means that if, if you start having impact on cotton price, on labor price, then all the markets will be affected because uh, when the labor price rises because the cotton industry is demanding lots of labor because they're making lots of profits, every firm is making profits. So then uh, as the wages rise, the profits will come down, but also the cost in other industries will rise. So, and they will rise differentially according to labor intensivity. Some labor uh, industries which are more labor intensive will have higher costs, some which are less in the, uh, labor intensive, they will have lower costs. So again, so th what that means is that we can't analyze demand and supply in isolation like your uh, textbooks tell you that you can. So what Srafa did, so real analysis of production can't be done in the way that is done in traditional economics textbooks. So what Srafa did was he, he realized this and he went on to develop his own methodology which is called uh, 
production of commodities by commodities very famous book so basically he, he invented what is called the input output table and leon tf also took it up i don't know whether it was independently or whether he was inspired by srafa but anyway it's the same model so you have so you create a enti a entirely different structure of the economy where every commodity has as input a fixed collection of the other commodities and so you make a table how what does it take to produce cotton well you have to put in so much land and so much labor and so much this and so much that and so much the other fertilizer whatever but these are all fixed proportions one set of fixed proportions so it's an activity analysis type model and every commodity has its own inputs and then you do analysis so it's kind of a general equilibrium analysis because everything is being taken care of at once and so this leads to a different type of economics now uh, uh here there are two things uh, it's it's a famous leon tf input output model to understand what this is thing is about and to be able to do the calculations which are complicated so uh, unfortunately if you read input output books you will uh, learn all about the calculations which the computer should do and you will learn very little about the concept which is what you need to learn uh, concepts are there uh, i don't know why but basically any uh, i studied mathematics but i was able to see through the technique allah taala had mercy on me and and to understand what was behind other people who study they can't understand me basically to explain the i think i already explained this in the math part that you take the uh, fractions and i can tell you the rule that okay you multiply the uh, denominators together and cross multiply denominator numerator add and you get the answer but why this works this is a the concept so the concept is different from the mechanics you can understand the concept and not know how to do the mechanics and vice versa so today your education is all about the mechanics and not about the concepts and what you need is an education on the concepts and not about the mechanics so leontief also uh, it's a very useful concept and it is it is a genuine production function model as opposed to the the wrong uh, fun theory that is taught in textbooks and so if you want to model production this is the right way to do it also uh, but there is a weakness in that in that it only assumes one activity so it's valid as long as the prices are stable but if the prices are changing then there might be changes in the activities which will not be picked up so now i want to carry this analysis a little bit further so i want to keep prices exogenous i want to consider the industry at the national level so now what i am going to do is assume that all of the raw materials are exported outside the country that's the only way to make sure that my price is exogenous so now the, the, the there is another thing there is a very important keynesian factor that if i um, if i hire laborers produce cotton and sell it in the country then the uh, sales are affected by the income that the laborers are making so there is a mutuality so you can't separate the supply and the demand because if you increase the supply uh, then um, the laborers will be having more income and they will be able to buy more shirts so uh, this this is exactly actually the basis of the keynesian theory that uh, uh, you should uh, just uh, throw some money into the economy when the firm start hiring then suddenly the demand that they don't see will come into existence because and this is exactly complexity because the firms are looking at the one by one level and they're saying there is no demand but at the aggregate level things will happen differently from what is happening at the uh, local level so uh, this is a complex phenomena so now we are going to avoid complexity and keep things simple by so that we can understand the simple model later on we will try to go towards the general equilibrium model where we study two things but first you have to understand one thing then you can understand two things that's the uh, if you try try to put everything into the model at once then you won't understand anything so we have a foreign demand for our cotton and suppose that uh, our nation is the unique producer uh, like there are some things like uh, uh, gum uh the is uh, produced by tree sap and this gum is used in coca cola and only sudan produces gum uh, 90% of the gum so now uh this uh, gum arabic which is sold to uh, 
uh, throughout the world. Uh, this uh, suppose that the demand for this gum is foreign, and suppose that it's a Cobb Douglas demand function. So we've already studied Cobb Douglas. This means that there is a constant amount of money that has been allocated. And so if you raise prices, your quantity will go down. So now it is the, in the interest of the rest of the world to tell Sudan that, look, you should have free trade and free markets. But what should uh, Sudan do? It should restrict its market to, uh, to produce the minimum amount because as you reduce the amount, the price goes up, so you will produce the same revenue. So why waste uh, energy and effort on producing large amounts and getting less money? And so, of course, um, this is something that you are familiar with if you have studied trade. Uh, there is the Lange learned condition that uh, producing more can actually lead to a loss because uh, the adverse effect on the price is larger than the gain. So when you produce more, uh, there is a additional delta Q of output, but there is a delta P of change in price. And so you have to take all the effects, the loss in price. The loss that happens in price applies to all of the previous units that you have produced. So it's rather big. So maybe this theory, I mean, Cobb Douglas may be a wrong assumption, but it's clear that as a monopolist in a commodity, we should not produce. And one more thing that uh, is important here is that if we are the sole producer of a key raw material, and we are selling it to others, like what happened in the um, colonization period, uh, then the only purpose of the sale is to make money uh, for our economy. We are not doing social service here. So we should try to maximize the profits and we should try to uh, uh, use our monopoly. Uh, so we should maximize revenue by restricting production, that's one thing. But there's another factor also which plays an important role which economists never take into account, uh, which is that uh, the industry can provide employment to people. So maybe we can have uh, uh, more production than the profit maximization level if we are giving jobs to our people because by engaging them in this industry they are earning a living for themselves. So that's fine if because uh, unemployment, we, we should, yani this is one thing that is the difference between Keynes and New Classical. Keynes says that we don't need to do anything about unemployment, free market will eliminate it. And today also uh, Lucas says the same thing. Uh, why, even though there is yani, such solid evidence that you can't, it's like saying that this wall is not there to say that uh, unemployment is uh, going to, uh, free market will eliminate it. There is so strong evidence. Still, the economists are themselves blind and they teach blindness. So, uh, even now, you know, um, we have free market ideologues pushing their ideology here. And uh, the thing to do is to, I mean, the, there are two key things where free markets fail. One is that they don't eliminate unemployment. And instead of saying this as a, as a general idea that labor markets don't work. You have to cite specifics that in the USA after the Great Depression, the uh, unemployment persisted for 19 years or something like that. Or, uh, similarly, in all over the world, uh, huge amounts of unemployment has been created. Like in Russia, the shock strategy was imposed and uh, uh, as a result, there was huge unemployment. Some people became very rich and a large people, a number of people became very hungry and lot, there was a famine, people starved to death. So uh, that's because free markets have this effect. They are free markets. The key yani, feature of free markets is that they create an uh, inequality between the rich and the poor and they concentrate wealth in the hands of the poor because the, and this is exactly what uh, basically the thesis of uh, Piketty. So Piketty is famous. So Piketty, we cite just to give authority. I mean, the fact is known from much before Piketty, but citing Piketty gives you some respectability. And people will say, oh, yes, Piketty. Piketty proves that in capitalism. Basically, Piketty's argument, very easy to understand. He says that um, the wealthy people earn 
higher return on their money than the poor people. If the poor person puts the money into the bank, he gets 6% or 10%. The rich person makes 20%. So, obviously, the rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poorer. This is a, the gap will widen. And he provides empirical evidence for that. So, uh, so suppose that we are the sole producer of key raw materials, then what we should do is we should uh, try to protect our raw materials. Uh, the other thing that was done by England is that they uh, prevented the imports of cloth which would not have allowed their industry to develop because when they uh, took over uh, India, their, our technology in cloth was more advanced than theirs and we had uh, better clothes and their, uh, their textile industry was still developing. So Adam Smith, who is a great free trader and he is always talking about how we should allow free trade, he said that in, the, uh, in textile industry, we should not allow the uh, Indian textiles to come in because our industry will not develop. So basically, and what Germany did and what every country which has radio is in the speakers automatically is kale speakers um, so how can we develop an industry well you see there are two major problems uh, large scale manufacturing is uh, requires any you know, learning by doing. Uh, you can't start out and uh, uh, defeat the giants and the champions. You have to, it takes a while to learn how to do it. Also, it uh, becomes more efficient at large scale. And you can't start out at a large scale because, I mean, again, it's infant industry argument is exactly right. I mean, you takes a while for the infant to grow up and you can't put an infant in the ring with um, the champions and expect that he will do well. So you can't allow him to compete. You need to protect the infant. So basically what you need is to uh, protect your, uh, I mean basically what they did was they prevented actually the export of wool because they wanted to make sure that the wool, if you export wool then your local industry has to compete in the world market to buy wool. So if uh, the market is restricted, then um, your wool becomes cheaper because uh, so um, so basically uh, you need to help your industry to develop otherwise it won't. Uh, now the counter argument which is made and correctly made, if you protect your industry then it never grows up, <laughs> the infant remains infant. So this is again like the lady and the tiger, <laughs> you see, everybody is biased, your industries are not interested in developing the country and becoming competitive. In, in fact, this happened in the USA, the Detroit uh, uh, complained again that Japanese exports are destroying us and we are losing jobs and we, so you put uh, protection against uh, industry and we will make our cars more efficient, that's what they promised. But uh, the US government uh, imposed a uh, export quota on Japan, you can't export more and they said okay you have time to build your industry. Instead of building their industry to be more efficient, they immediately jacked up the prices and made huge profits and they didn't do anything to improve the efficiency of the cars. So this happens everywhere, so if you protect your industry, it will become fat and lazy. If you uh, have uh, um, 
If you don't protect, they will never grow. So there is no easy solution. Korea found a very clever solution and this is what the East Asian they did. Uh, it's a very simple idea. What they said was, okay, first year we provide you with 100% protection. We, that means that everything which is coming in will get 100% tariffs. So they will uh, double cost. Uh, second year we will reduce that to 90%. Uh, in the tenth year it will be at 0%. And also they said that in order to get this benefit you have to export 10% of your goods in the first year, 20% in the second year, things like that, to make sure that the product that they are manufacturing is quality. So they, it was a very tightly controlled industry. This is what's called industrial policy. So uh, just yani, basically uh, to say that protection will lead to industry development is a mistake. Protection does not lead to the growth of You have to do industrial policies. You have to strategize against the outside enemy and against the inside enemies. So um, then uh, so a clever strategy can work and that has been done. Now, uh, again, uh, not quite related to our problem, but uh, you can ask about FDI uh, and people ask and Every other thesis is asking, is FDI good or bad? And we run a regression on GNP and we find out. It's ridiculous because um, FDI by itself can be good or it can be bad. It depends on how you get FDI. So in uh, NAFTA, uh, the Mexico was uh, made a free trade agreement with Mexico. The U.S. industry just shifted their factories into Mexico, hired cheap labor from Mexico, made lots of Americans unemployed, uh, increased their profits, and brought no benefits to Mexico because the they were manufacturing spare parts for use in American uh, automobiles. There was no backward linkage, no forward linkage. There was no. All that happened was that some laborers got jobs, and even then they were cheap jobs. They were not allowed into the managerial position. There was no skill learning. So it was actually quite harmful. But on paper, you can make it look good because you can show that. Uh, and, and this is a very important part of the game. You have to learn how disasters are marketed as tremendous successes. So NAFTA, I mean, still now there's controversy. And if you listen to The Economist, yes, free trade was a great success. So why? Because there was lots of technology in Mexico, yes, that there was very advanced technology that was being used in Mexico to manufacture parts, but it didn't actually go into Mexico, it just was, a, it's a, similarly the laborer's wage rose, but uh, actually Mexico lost, and they, they, basically they were uh, any, working for America, they were not actually benefiting their own economy wage became more expensive to hire for domestic industry, harming the domestic industry. And so, uh, but if you look at the aggregate gross national product, and if you calculate correctly that the exports to, uh, to America rose because the parts that were manufactured in, assembled in uh, Mexico, they, they were sent to their parent company at, uh, at artificial prices designed to cheat Mexico of the revenue, but still exports rose. So the same, you know, the reality can be presented statistically in different ways and this is happening all the time. So a good economist will know how to see through deception in statistical figures, where the, where the problem is likely to be. This, if you understand real economy, then you will be able to see. So these are things which are happening and people are just, uh, the companies, uh, they buy up the relevant officials and the others who are regulators, they don't have enough interest in the matter to go after them. So then uh, it's become difficult. Yani our auto industry is quite fat and inefficient and lazy. And um, if we were just to allow the import of used cars, the industry would collapse. So they ensure that um, there are very high tariffs against used car and they uh, provide gifts of brand new Toyotas to the relevant people so that the policies have not changed against them. So, 
So now China is a very good example in the sense of that the, they used the FDI very well, but again they ensured that the FDI was on their terms. So Boeing they offered a very great uh, benefit that you can come in and have our huge China market, but there is one condition that you must uh, in, in the first year of production you must let us make 10% domestically assemble and you must make sure that at all levels of management there are some Chinese people and eventually in the second year we, we must manufacture 20% of the plane domestically and in 10 years all of the parts must be domestically manufactured that way they, they acquired an airplane industry and also they said that okay the management should be transferred gradually to the Chinese so with that, uh, you can the FDI was useful, but the same FDI can be useful or harmful. And if you just look at the data, numbers, and GNP, you'll never get any understanding of what's going on. So now uh, we consider still the case that okay, instead of one country which is producing raw material, suppose there are multiple countries which are producing raw material. So this is like the standard uh, rich and poor country. This idea of developing and developed is very harmful. There is no, there is no sense. Actually, there are many senses in which we can say that we are far more developed than the USA uh, in terms of actually humanity. In terms of, but um, um, in wealth, yes, they are richer than we are. We are poor but honourable, hopefully. Although. The poor man doesn't have much honor, so it's difficult. So, um, suppose we have multiple producers of raw materials, like cotton is being produced, and wheat is being produced. So, what should we do? Uh, well, this model tells us, and, and all of it is being sold, so nothing is domestically consumed. This is the model that was try that they attempted to enforce on the real world. On the, on the post-colonial structure, it was, and he, we were told explicitly that adv comparative advantage of India is in production of raw materials and England has the comparative advantage of making shirts, so uh, you just send us our cotton and we will manufacture and we will sell them back to you, which is ridiculous, but that's what that theory says. That, and this theory is completely wrong, of course, but uh, this theory was sold and used as a basis. So theories are weapons. They are false theories are weapons that are used to convince people of wrong uh, policies, wrong economic policies. So now if we um, consider that, okay, we are in, stuck in this position where we have raw materials only and we have to sell them, then the uh, objective should be to maximize profits collectively as nations. And this is exactly what was done by OPEC. Uh, they combined together and uh, if you look at the oil prices, the OPEC was formed in 1974, you have a little jump. That's when uh, basically the USA uh, supported Israel in the Yom Kippur war. You have to know some of history to understand. And then what uh, uh, Arab nations did was they boycotted USA. Uh, for oil, so oil prices rose in the USA, stagflation occurred, Keynesian economy was knocked down, it's really very complicated sequence of events. Anyway, you see that there was a small blip. Uh, finally, they understood that we have monopoly power and we can raise the prices. Uh, so, the prices uh, rose a lot uh, and then there was another jump in 1978, another historical event occurred which you can track down to get more understanding. So, uh, again, uh, this is actually in the collective interest of the uh, poor countries to combine because the commodities are really a competitive market and competitive market is extremely harmful for us as we saw in the model that uh, if you allow uh, that, that we lose the monopoly rent and the sole purpose of, if the sole purpose of producing commodity is to earn money, then we should try to get for monopoly rent. So uh, many economists in, there is a, a Latin American school called the dependency school 
and economists in uh, the poorer countries have seen through. No economist in the Western world has seen what has been seen and what they say is that we have une uneven exchange, they take our commodities at competitive prices and then they sell us branded goods, they sell us these floppy disks, marginal cost production is one rupee but they sell it for hundred dollars because it has a patented program. So they protect their uh, um, uh, their uh, knowledge by monopoly rights, by monopoly methods and they uh, take our uh, products at uh, competitive prices and they ensure uh, the spread of ideas about free market, they set up institutions which uh, brainwash people into believing that free markets are best and uh, they sell advanced products at exorbitant prices so they, they make they make out like bandits as they say in the USA that they make uh, money and uh, we don't even get the advantage of the raw material that we have. So what we need to do is protect that, use monopolies to maximize profits on that and use that money to create industry so that we don't, we are not in this trap. Now, I guess we are at the end of the slides. Yeah. Um, there is a cartel game that uh, I was going to play. In fact, I have played it in other classes, which shows why it is difficult to uh, maintain a cartel. So that's something that's important to learn. Uh, so we'll see. Maybe next year, next week, I can do something with that. And so now this is all the simplest supply and demand model where we have the prices are exogenous. As soon as you allow your commodity to enter your own economy, then you get real serious complications, and that's what basically slowly uh, and and it's, it has to be done very carefully. The one complication at a time. Uh, so, if you go to the general equilibrium model, you can't understand anything because all things depend on everything else. And that's actually what the Leontief model is and that's what the um, Strafa model is, that all things depend on everything. You can't say anything. You can't say that the price will go up. And In fact, the standard uh, way in which you have been taught to think is wrong. I mean, and it's uh, and students don't understand. Students, uh, let alone students, faculty don't. Suppose they don't, doesn't understand. So because they don't understand exogenity and endogeneity. So I'm going to explain this very important thing because it's very directly related to this lecture because we discussed exogeneity. So suppose I ask you the question that uh, what, uh, how much will you consume? if the price of Coca-Cola goes up tomorrow or if the price of rice goes up or if the price of... So this is supposedly the demand function. Now the demand function doesn't exist. Why? Because the price is not an exogenous variable. Price is an endogenous variable in the supply and demand model. It is determined by the intersection of the supply and demand. So if I am asked what happens if the price goes up I have to ask you why did the price go up? Did the supply curve shift or uh, did the demand curve shift? It, depending on why the price uh, changed, price can't change by itself. Price is fixed by the equilibrium. So even the asking the question is a meaningless question. Why did the, so now it depending on, was it a temporary equilibrium shift? Was it due to a sudden short, uh, short shock in the supply curve, which will be made up tomorrow? My response to what I will do in, uh, in terms of a price change will depend on the reason for the price change. This is something not understood. So you ask these MCQs that what will happen to wheat if the price changes? You can't answer this question because why did the price of wheat is, is essential? And I can, you, know, you can construct the model and see that, okay, construct the supply and demand, say, okay, the price goes up. What will the effect? Well, it depends on, I mean, you, you, you do your own model and you will see that it depends on why the price went up as to what the consequences of price going up are. So, uh, the wrong, I mean, because you don't understand the difference between exogenous and endogenous, so you say, okay, now let us make price exogenous because now I make it 
uh, now I'm not going to think about it. So not thinking about price doesn't make it exogenous. And because the students are not uh, explained to, to them what exogenous and endogenous, so they, they, they are asked these wrong questions and they can't understand that there's something wrong with the question. And uh, so this confusion is massive. So this whole theory is internally inconsistent, wrong, incoherent, and there is only one purpose to all of this theory, and it is to prove that laborers are not being exploited. Okay, so I think that's all for today.